our kind and loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for another day of life. Thank you so much, Lord, for this privilege. It is truly a privilege that we still have this opportunity to come together and study your word. Even though we're in different parts of the world, we are so thankful, Lord, for yeah, your providence in leading everyone to this platform. Thank you so much for the truths that you've been teaching us. And we just pray, Lord, may our hearts be fertile ground, that the seeds of truth that Jesus has been casting within our hearts would bear fruit unto holiness and righteousness. Please may you bless us now as we are about to study your word. Please may you impart to us your divine spirit. May our hearts and minds be open up to comprehend the truth we are about to learn. And also, Lord, we just pray may this truth be a shield, a shield against the deadly delusions that are waiting to take the world captive. Please may you bless us now and abide with us. For we ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. What are we going to do? I think um, we might have seven lessons left and we would have come to our conclusion. So I, what I'm, okay, maybe at the end I would say, but I was thinking that we do not break because we normally have a break that we would actually not have that break due to the long break we had. So what we're going to do today, we're going to study the first angel's message and we're going to study it in light of um, the issue of spiritualism. Now what I'm going to say is this, that the first angel's message does not warn us against anything. That is not his duty. His duty is to present truth. That's the first angel. Where we see a warning is in the second and in the third. What, I, what I'm suggesting is this. If we embrace the first angel, we are actually safe against the warning against the, the second and the warning against the third. The second angel's message announces Babylon has fallen. And that's going to be a beautiful study when we study it, when we look at the issue of Babylon. And that, we're going to just study the Bible and the Bible is going to speak so clearly. I think even yeah, a child will be able to understand the second angel's message. That's how simple God has made it. Nevertheless, the second angel comes and he announces that Babylon has fallen. Why has Babylon fallen? It says that the, sec that the angel followed him saying Babylon has fallen, has fallen. So immediately after the first angel, a, a, another angel, which is the second angel, follows the first angel. So those who reject those who reject the first angel, what the second angel is telling me, that whoever rejects the first angel becomes a part of Babylon. Anyone who rejects the first angel becomes a part of Babylon. And what we're going to show is that everything that the first angel teaches, in our, in, when we get there, that everything that the first angel teaches, Babylon teaches the opposite. And we're going to show only Bible. Bible's going to show us this. Then the third angel follows and he warns against the issue of false worship. Now question, does the first angel reveal to me true worship? I'm asked, does the first angel reveal true worship? Yes. So the third angel comes warning against false worship. Now let me ask you this. If I embrace the first angel and true worship, do I have anything to be concerned about concerning the third angel's warning? Nope. It's if I reject the first angel, then I'm in great danger of actually entering into experience of false worship. So what I'm saying is if one embraces the first angel, you are protected against the warning of the second and you are protected against the third. When I say that, meaning you're protected against the delusions of, of what the third angel warns against. So our safety is found in the first angel's message. Now, I want us to read a quotation. And then we're going to go to the first angel and show the, connect, the connecting link. I want us to read a quotation. Let's pull up the quotation. Um, now, I sh hmm, you know what? Let me, let's blank this first. Let's blank this. Can I ask a question? Maybe before I read that. Can I ask a question? Does anybody know what is the two the two, the two deceptions that Satan's going to bring upon the world to actually garner in the entire world. He's going to use two. The two deceptions he's going to use to garner in the entire world. And I'm saying, one of these deceptions, it crosses every border and every religion. Whereas the other one, I'm going to say, is in order to deceive people with that one, he's going to use climate change because climate change also crosses all borders. 
which gives birth to that, that one. But does anybody know, what are these two deadly delusions that Satan is going to take the world captive by? Two great errors. Actually, inspiration calls them the two great errors. Sister Emma, see you got your hand. I, I'm going to say spiritualism mm. and false, false day of worship. Amen, amen, amen. Out of the two, which one do you think would Satan use to corner in the entire... He actually is going to use both. But which one do you think is going to be his, the, the key one to get the entire world on his side? Spiritualism. Oh, amen. <laughs> okay, brother Kevin, I see you. You want to say something? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I think that the first thing that comes to yes. my head that's drilled into my head by you is yes. the appetite and passion. Okay, so, okay, yes. So I'm seeing maybe there's another couple more. Yes, yes. Actually, appetite and passion is the tool. What I'm going to say is appetite and passion open up the door for all other deceptions of Satan. Yeah, if, if, I, if, if I fail on appetite and passion, then what happens is the door is almost open for Satan to come in with his delusions. But you know that not every hook, I'm saying what someone, what one fish will bite a hook, not all fish are gonna bite that same hook. So he has different bait, so to speak, for different people. But there are two primary things that he's gonna actually take the, world, the entire world captive by. Let's see what are these two things. Um, let's see. Now, maybe before I, I'll come back to that. Let's read this. Let's read this. This is from the book Early Writings. Um, this is from Early Writings, page 88. Now, what the prophet sees here in vision, this is Bible. We're gonna, you know what, I'm going to say this, whatever the prophet says, the Bible says the exact same thing. Everything the Bible says, the prophet says, what the prophet says, the Bible says. Now I want you to see this quotation. Inspiration is going to tell us that the entire world she saw, the entire world was on board on a train. The entire world was on board on a train. And this train was moving with the speed of lightning. And she asks, like, where is this train going? It's moving at such speed. The angel told her that this train is on its way to perdition. It's actually moving at the speed of lightning to perdition, to destruction. And I want you to see what the prophet sees. What is this train? What is this train that the entire world is on board? And she saw the captain, like the one who was in charge of this train. And she said, everyone reverenced him. I wonder who was that individual. I want you to see what inspiration says. Now, what I believe is this quotation, we're about to see it be fulfilled. I believe we're on the borders of its fulfillment. Let's see what it says. Now, she's not talking about a literal train. This is symbolic language. But nonetheless, this train is symbolic of something. Let's see what she says. Early writings, page 88. She says, I saw the rapidity with which this delusion was spreading. In other words, when she says rapidity, the, the falseness that this delusion was spreading. Now, by the way, if you want to understand what delusion is she referring to, all you have to do is read the pe uh, previous paragraph, which she explains at spiritualism. Now, let's keep reading. She says, a train, a train of cars was shown me, going with the speed of lightning. Okay, so this train is moving with the speed of lightning. The angel bade me look carefully. I fixed my eyes upon the train. It seemed, take note what inspiration says, it seemed that the old world was on board and that could, and there could not be, and there, sorry, that there could not be left, oh, what am I reading? That there could not be one left. Now let's pause. I want to ask a question. How many people are on board on the train? Now be careful with how you answer. Look at the quotation. How many? How, no, 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 no. Uh, look, look carefully at the quotation. It seemed. It seemed. So you have to read inspiration very carefully because one can come up to the conclusion the whole world. If she said the whole world, that means we are all doomed. That means including myself. That means you. Watch carefully what the prophet says. It seemed that the old world was on board. So as she looks at it in vision, in her eyes it seemed, she says, it seemed to her that everyone was on board on this train. 
that was moving with the speed of lightning. And what he is saying it is a delusion, that the inner delusion that this thing represents, a delusion in which the entire world is on board. No, not the entire world, but it seemed to her that the entire world was on board. And that there could be, and that there could not be one left. Let's keep reading. Said the angel, now this angel is an uh, accompanying angel. Said the angel, they are binding in bundles ready to burn. So question, can I ask a question now? Where are these people on their way to? Where is this train taking them? There's a destination, but based upon the sentence I just read, where is the destination that this train is leading them? They in almost the entire world. Based on the just sentence I read. Where, where, where are they? Sorry? Someone said? Dead. Dead. Amen. The lake of fire. The lake of fire. How, how, how did you get the lake of fire? How did you get that? Said the angel. Yes. They are binding in bundles ready to burn. So where are these people? What is happening to these people? They're getting prepared to get what? To get burned. Now, mm -hmm. there's only one thing that burns. That is hell. Hellfire. Hellfire, yes. Then she continues. Friends, do you know if I'm saying, if, the, if God forbid that any one of us are on this train. Now, I think... The prophet never sees faces. She just saw the entire world on board and she, there's no names there. God forbid that we are on this train. You say, why is that? Because if you are on this train, you're going to look at Satan with reverence. That's what inspiration says. If you are taken captive by this delusion, you're going to actually reverence Satan. That's revelation. Someone says, where's that Bible? What Bible says that Revelation 13 verse 4 that those who are deluded are going to worship the dragon. They're going to reverence the dragon, and the dragon is Satan. Now, I'm going to show what she says here as Bible, but let's keep reading, and then we're going to show the link with the first angel. She continues, uh, highlighted dark words. Then the angel, her company angel, then he showed me the conductor. That's the one in charge of this train, who appeared like a stately fair person. In other words, it seemed, it seemed to be a, a good person, so to speak, whom all the passengers looked up to and reverenced. Mm, I wonder who is this, that the entire world, almost the entire world is reverencing just before Jesus Christ comes. Friends, I, you know what? I believe this quotation. I believe every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, whether it's from the Bible or whether it's from the spirit of prophecy. If the prophet says this, this is going to be fulfilled. Now let's see. Who is this that everyone's, everyone is reverencing? They're looking up to. Who is controlling the train? The red words. I was perplexed, the prophet says. And I asked my attending angel who it was. He said, it, it is Satan. Who is the entire, almost the entire world reverencing? Satan. Satan. He is the conductor in the form, take note, not as the devil, he's not appearing, he's not deceiving the world as the devil. How is he deceiving them? He is the, he is the conductor in the form of an angel of light. So friends, tell me, how is Satan going to be, uh, this train is on its way to hell. And who is on board? Almost the entire world. And who are they reverencing on this train? The devil, Satan. But now question, how did Satan get them onto this train? Was he appearing to them as the devil or did he appear to them as an angel of light, so to speak? Now when I say angel of light, angel of light. Now not literally he appeared as an angel of light, but he almost used light, some truth mixed with error to get them on board. And then she says, continues, dark words, he has taken the world captive. Take note, they are given the world, that's the world, they are given over to strong delusions, to believe a lie, that they may be damned. Mm. Now, let's, pa let's pause there. Can someone tell me who is in charge of the train? Who is the conductor? It's the devil. Do you know that the conductor has an engineer next to him on the train? 
And this person, they also reverence. Who is the engineer on the train? Everyone reverence the, the conductor. They will all, obviously, they will reverence the engineer. Who is the engineer on board? Let's continue. She says, this agent, the next highest in order to him. Pause. Who is the him? Who is this? Who is this? Who is the him? That she, sorry? Who is the, she says, this agent mm -hmm. next highest in order to him. Who is the him? Who is the him here? Satan. 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 So there's someone next highest to Satan. As, as, as in heaven, there's order. I'm going to say with the powers of darkness, there's also some sort of order. Satan stands at the head of them. But there's someone who stands next in rank to Satan. This agent, God forbid, friends, you're on this train. God forbid that you're on this train. Why? Because on this train, oh, peop, oh friends, the, the, the persons who are reverent are the highest demons. From the fallen angel Lucifer to the next in rank to him. This agent, the next highest in order to him, is the engineer. And other of his agents are employed in different office as he may need them. Take note the conclusion of the matter. Where are they all moving to the entire world? Almost the entire world. And they are all, and they are all going with lightning speed to perdition. Now imagine you are in a train, friends. And I'm saying now literally imagine you in a train. How sad that that train is destined. That man who was in that train, he is destined to kill everyone on board. And you don't know. You, you are happily there thinking you're going to your destination. Now, that, that is a bad, I'm saying literally for families on a train and there's some madman at the head of that train and he's planning on derailing that train and killing everyone. That is bad. But how bad it is to be, I would say, almost rocked in a cradle of carnal security to wake up, not in the first resurrection, but to wake up in the second res resurrection and realize that the person you were reverencing just before you died was the highest demon in hell. That's about to be fulfilled. Now, I believe this study, if received, will protect us from being on board on that train. This study we're about to do will shield me from that. Now, I'm not saying this is the only study. All truths here to fall, if received, what this truth will shield me. But this truth specifically designed to shield me from that. But if I reject other truths we have studied thus far, even if you embrace this one, you will still be in that train. Now, how many people were on board on that train? Sister Jen, you want to answer? How many people were on board? It seemed like the whole world. It seemed like the whole world. Let's go back to the quotation. Let's read the next paragraph. Now tell me from the next paragraph we're about to read, can someone tell me how many people Actually, does the prophet say there was anyone left? Does she tell us? And if she does say there were anyone left, please tell me how many people were left. Not so much by number, but by percentage. Let's see. None. Okay, wait, let's watch the quotation. Let's look at the quotation. Let's look at the quotation. Let's see. Yes. Okay, this thing's just jamming. Okay. Let's, let's look. This is the next paragraph. Few people were left. No. Let, let's see. Let's see. Early writings page. This is the very... Okay. This is the very next paragraph. It says, I asked... Now, now the prophet is worried. Because what the prophet sees, she's almost worried. So what she does, it leads to a question. Because what she saw worries her. I asked the angel if there were none left. In other words, is there anyone left from, or anyone preserved from this deadly delusion that takes the world captive? He paid me. That's the angel now. I want you to see. He paid me, the accompanying angel. He paid me. Look in an, look in an opposite direction. And I saw a little company traveling a narrow pathway. Pause.
friend, you know what? These quotations are so wonderful. Like you could sit and read and there's so many things you can pick up from these quotations. And you have to read inspira inspiration slowly, especially when you're reading things like this. Now, friends, I want to ask, based on the sentence I just read, how many, how many parts are there based on what we just previously read and what we are now reading? How many parts are there? How many directions, so to speak? Yeah. There's two. How do we know there are two? Because look at the blue words. He paid me look in the opposite direction. So one, one, the train is moving in one direction and there's a little company that is moving in another direction, actually the opposite direction. Now, if you study carefully, not my study now, but when you study carefully, just taking a book, early writings, and you look at who is this little company. If you just take early writings, you would see that the little company refers only to one group. It's the 144,000. Now, I want us to continue reading. All, that's the little company, all seem to be firmly united, bound together by the truth. Pause. Friends, what were this company bound together by? The truth. Now you help me. In the previous paragraph, what was everybody bound together by? What, 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 did, they, what did the people do? Amen. Uh, they were actually, if you, look, if you look at the underlying words, what got the other company? What, doesn't, what, what separates the two companies? As one company believes a lie, whereas the other company believes the truth. You say, how, how do I know that? One company believes a lie, one company believes the truth. That separates them. Because if you look at the underlined words, they are given over to Amen. They are given over to strong delusions to believe a lie that they may be damned. Now, someone might say, hey, the prophet is harsh. Why, why would God give them over to strong delusions to believe a lie? Actually, she is quoting Bible. Actually, not, it's not even the, the prophet speaking here. These are the words of the angel. It's not, not the prophet. It's the words of the angel. Now, if you read, she's quoting Bible. She's quoting, the, sorry, the angel is quoting the Bible. Second Thessalonians teaches us. Come with me to Second Thessalonians. I want you to see why are they given to the strong delusions. I, I'm not finished with these quotations. Come with me to say, and then we want to study the first angel. Come in your Bible to Second Thessalonians. We're going to Second Thessalonians. I want us to see chapter two. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Take note, Second Thessalonians two. I'm going to start in verse ten, and I'm going to read verse eleven. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, With all the civilness of unrighteousness in them that perish. So here's a group of people that are going to perish. Why will they perish? Because there's the reason why they're going to perish, why they're going to be lost, why they're going to be burnt. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, because they don't want the truth. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie, that they all may be damned, who believe not the truth, but had the pleasure in unrighteousness. So what the, what, what the Bible teaches me through the Apostle Paul is that because people did not receive the truth, they did not love the truth. Love the truth and receive the truth. Love the truth, receive the truth. When someone loves the truth, they receive the truth, and what that does, it brings about a change within their lives. That person loves the truth. But because they did not love the truth, God gives them the opposite of truth, what they want. What is the opposite of a truth? If something is not a truth, what is it? It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. Amen. Sister Keicher? Maybe you'll touch on this, but yes. what really jumped out to me is mm. the two methods of travel that they're on. Oh, the group that's believing the delusion is on a train, mm. and the other group is on a path, which seems to me like to be slow, mm. hard, yes. a bit more treacherous versus ah. something that's kind of um, flashy, mm. it goes fast, it's quite appealing, comfortable. Mm. 
Yeah. And those two things really, uh, those differences really stood out to me. Amen. Powerful, 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 powerful. Th thank you so much. That is powerful. Let, let us continue. Actually, this is what she's gonna. What you just said now, sister. Inspiration is gonna say that these people are walk. Now, if you've been walking for long, you get tired. I want you to see what she says here. Back to the quotation about this little company. She says, "Said the angel, said the angel, the third angel is binding or sealing." Are you getting an identity? Are we seeing what's this little company? I don't know if you can see that this little company has been under a, a special work of the third angel. And the work of the third angel based on this, what is the work of the third angel based on this? I don't know if you can see that it mentions two things, but there's specifically one thing that's then. Sorry? What? Feeling. Amen. It's sealing. So can you see that the little company, based on this quotation, are those who received what? The seal. The seal of the living God. The third angel is binding or sealing them in bundles for the heavenly corner. This little company, take note. How? What is the description of this company? This little company look careworn. That means... It was wearisome, this journey that they were taking. This little company looked careworn, as if they had passed through severe trials and conflicts. So if I'm going to, are you seeing that one part requires me, if I'm, if I'm going to get to my destination and travel this part, this part that leads actually to the gates of heaven, it is a part that is full of trials and conflicts. It is a part full of trials and conflicts. Friends, we are not to, we are not to mum when trials come. It is God's means of, of I, I would say, his means of preparation for heaven. When conflicts come, we are not to mama. These are God's, even when these conflicts are painful, when these trials are painful, let no words of mama escape your lips. If anything escapes your lips, praise God in the midst of their trial. Do what Job done, though everything was taken from him. What did Job do? He praised the Lord. And 144,000, by the way, Job is a type of that final generation. Nonetheless, let's continue. That's not, not, not our talk. Our study, it continues. It says, and it, appeared, and, if the, as, and it appeared as if the sun had just risen behind a cloud and shone upon their countenance. Pause. The part that they were traveling was a shiny, sunny part. Or was it a, a pot full of clouds? Sunny path. Okay. Look. It was a dark path. It was a it was a it was a dark pot. Behind the cloud. Yes, the sun the at. The sun was rising behind the cloud. Yes. So just look look carefully. It says it appeared as if the sun. Take no. Look at look. You have to read inspiration carefully. It says. As if the sun had what? Chest. Chest. What does chest mean? If you, there's clouds, and then she says the sun had chest risen. What does that mean? Was the sun always shining? Or, or now the sun seems to about shining? What, what does that indicate? What was their pot like? Was it a beautiful sunny pot full of roses? Or was it, there was dark clouds, tribes, and conflicts? How, how would you picture their pot? Yeah, that was dark cloud. Yes. Child, I'm Amen. Amen. Friends, I don't know if this is not our study, but God wants us to understand this. He just wants us to understand this. That the path that we are traveling is not a rosy path. If if you want a rosy path, you can travel the broad and the broad way. I'm I'm saying it, it appears rosy, but the Bible says that the path of destruction is a hard path. There's no peace, there's no joy. You might get what you want. But when you get it, you're not going to be happy. That's not a good part. The, I, I, I would prefer to have trials, conflicts, and have joy and peace than to have everything warm that, that the mind might flash and be miserable. Now, if we're going to make it, if we're going to enter into those gates, if we're going to receive the seal, according to this quotation, we have to travel a path that is full of trials and conflicts. 
So let's, let's finish this quotation and then get into our study. And it appeared as if the sun had just risen from behind a cloud and shone upon their countenance, causing them to look triumphant as if their, victory, their victories were nearly won. So when the prophet saw this, she saw that this group was just about finished their, their, their journey and victory seems that they already, victory was theirs. Actually, what he has painted in the picture of the second coming of Jesus here. Yeah. So now, I want us to get into our study and see, like, how can we be protected from this delusion that is going to take the world captive? How can we be protected? Because the entire world will be on board. You know what? Let's show that what the prophet says, the Bible says, what the Bible says, the prophet says. Come with me to, I'm coming back, there's maybe one more quotation before we actually get into the first angel. Come with me to Revelation 16. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation the 16th chapter. I want us to say, Revelation 16, I want us to start in verse 13. Revelation 16, verse 13, and then we're going to read verse 14. It says in Revelation 16, verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophets. Now let's just pause there. God sends three angels' messages to prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus. Satan has a counterfeit, so to speak, a counterfeit, counterfeit messages, which are symbolic, not of angels. He doesn't, not, not used by angels, but what are the three things that he, you, what, what does God symbolize? His counterfeit messages of the three angels' messages, three frogs. Now, mm, a thought flash, but let's read, let's keep reading. Before I continue, okay, let's read, I'll come back to verse 13. I want us to see verse 14. Speaking about these, un these frogs that come out of the mouth of the beast, the, the, the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of false prophet, what are these? For they are spirits of devils working miracles. Now, let's just pause. Let me ask a question. In this verse that we've just read now, verse 14, spirits of devils working miracles. Is this a demonic manifestation of, 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 of supernatural power? Would you agree with me that verse 14 is a demonic manifestation of supernatural power? Because it says these are spirits of devils working miracles. Yes, yes it's, 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 yes. Question, did we see in early writings a train? And a train is, is symbolic of the, the, the delusions that are going to take the world captive. What kind of delusions? Demonic delusions. Why? Satan is there and all his demons are there. What are they doing? They comforting the world, so to speak, as they are moving with lightning speed to perdition. So what the prophet sees there, we are seeing a similar thing. Now the prophet says she saw almost the whole world. Let's see, does John in Revelation tell us almost the whole world was gathered on the wrong side? Verse 14. It says, For they are spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, take note, and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So based on verse 14, will almost the entire world be against God in the final hours of this earth's history? And what got the world there? What got the world there? It was demonic, an exhibition of demonic or demonic, supernatural power so to speak that got the world on board not to be in harmony with God but to be against God now friends both the Bible is telling me this and the spirit of prophecy is telling me this that almost the entire world are going to be taken captive by demonic supernatural power what supernatural power is that? I'm going to tell you what is spiritualism now uh, it's not my purpose now to explain verse 13 of who is the beast, who is the false prophet, who is the dragon. But I want to just show us that this is a threefold union. 
a threefold union that actually is going to get the entire world in unison in apostasy against God. We'll study this out in another study and we're going to prove this. The beast is the papacy. The false prophet is apostate Protestantism. We're going to prove that. Not now. The dragon. Now, let me ask you, who primarily is the dragon? Primarily, who is the dragon? Primarily. Revelation says there was war in heaven. And then it Satan. says Satan. The now, dragon. yes, the dragon is Satan. Now, where do we see, by the way, in Revelation 12, it says the dragon is Satan. But it also gives him another name in Revelation 12. The serpent. The serpent. The serpent. Yes. So the dragon, the serpent, is the devil. Now, where do we first see in the Bible the devil appearing? I'm saying, where would you first see the devil appearing in the Bible? First time ever. Yep. Garden of Eden. 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 Now, remember, the dragon is the devil. Where was the first appearance? In Eden. What was the first... What was the, remember, the whole world is going to be taken captive and they're going to believe a lie that they might be damned with pleasure and unrighteousness. What was the first lie that Satan you shall, not surely die. you shall not surely die. What is that inferring? Natural immortality of the soul. Spiritualism, uh, natural immortality of the soul opens up the door for spiritualism. Because if you believe that the dead are not truly dead, as Satan said, you shall not surely die. That means even though we see someone dead, no, 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 they're not dead. They're actually alive. And as soon as I bite the hook of Satan of Genesis, where he says you shall not surely die, that means that even though the person is dead, the person is still alive. They're not, they're not truly dead. And when I believe that, it opens up the door where I, can, where I think I can now communicate with the dead. And once you believe that lie, you're setting yourself up. Actually, you're throwing yourself into that train that is moving with lightning speed to perdition. So when it says the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, this is an unholy union. That dragon is actually spiritualism. Why? Because Satan is the dragon. What was his first lie? Thou shalt not surely die. Genesis chapter 3. Now, yes, um, Kenzie? Yeah, um, one thing also that yes. I find is taking over the world too is that when people love one dies, is that they go directly to heaven. Yes. That, that, is, that, is, that is opening up the door for spiritualism. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I want us to read this quotation. Let's, let's look at this quotation. Um, it says, this is from Great Controversy 588. Great Controversy, page 588. Inspiration says, through two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. So there are two things Satan's going to use. Immortality of the soul, which we just saw revelations, mentions demonic supernatural power, and also Sunday sacredness, which is false worship, a false day of worship. Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. Whilst the former, what would the former be out of the two? That would be immortality of the soul. Whilst the former lays the foundation for spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. Sunday actually creates a bond of sympathy with Rome because Sunday comes from Rome. Now, I want us to see this quotation. Tell me what are the three, the three parts that are going to bring deception or what three entities will be used to bring deception upon the entire world. We know what it is, the deception, it's immortality of the soul, Sunday sacredness. But what three entities? Take note. The Protestants of the United States. Can somebody tell me, based on the Bible, where would you place Protestantism? Out of the beast, the false prophets, and, and the dragon. Where would you place the, out of those three? Protestants of the United States. Out of the false prophets. The false prophets will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf 
to, cro to cr cross the hand of spiritualism. Out of the three, where would you place, which out of the three, the dragon, peace, false prophet, would you place spiritualism? Dragon. The dragon. The dragon. They will reach over the abyss to cross the hand, to cross hands with the Roman power. Uh, where, which one, which out of those three would be the Roman power, the beast, the false prophets, and the dragon? Which one was, the, which one is, the, amen. The beast. Amen. Under the influence of this threefold union, this country, let's pause, which country is she referring to? United States. United States. This country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So what inspiration is saying, spiritualism, apostate Protestantism, and the papal system are going to unite and the whole world will be taken captive by these powers. What I want to deal with in this study is the issue of the immortality of the soul. Let's deal with this issue of the immortality of the soul. I want us to look and look at the first angel's message. Come with your Bible to Revelations chapter 14 and see, does the first angel come, does it reveal to me this issue? Does it reveal to me this issue concerning the state of the dead? Does it reveal to me the state of the dead? Can someone read for us Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, about the first angel? Revelation 14, verse 7. With a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Amen. Amen. So the first angel announces, this, this is the aspect I want to deal with and see if we can see the state of the dead in this aspect. Because immortality of the soul, we have to go and study as man naturally immortal. What does the Bible teach concerning this? And in order to understand the state of the living, if man is con if he's naturally immortal, then we're going to have to study the state of the dead. You can't understand the state of the living unless you understand the state of the dead. So we have to go and understand the state of the dead to understand, is, is man naturally immortal? Now, does the first angel bring to view the issue of the state of the dead? This is how I see it. The angel says, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. So this angel announces God's judgment hour. Now can you remind me, was judgment always taking place, or was there a specific time in which judgment began? There was a specific time. A specific time. hour. Yes, the hour of his judgment. That, that indicates that judgment, there was a specific time, boom, judgment began. Keep that in mind. I want, you to come, I want us to link this with another scripture and tell me, does this scripture start, just looking at the scripture shows me, let's look at the scripture, let's look at it. Come with me to Hebrews. I want you to see that based on this scripture, linking itself to the judgment, it's going to show me, it's going to bring to view the issue of the state of the dead. Come with me in your Bible. Hebrews 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9. Now, let me ask a question while you're turning to Hebrews 9. I want to ask a question. Let me ask you this. Does anyone go to heaven? Does anyone go to hell? Or is, be, before anyone goes to heaven or hell, is there a work of judgment? Does anyone just boom, heaven? Anyone just boom, hell? Or does God first investigate and judge and determine before anyone goes to heaven or hell? What, what, what would you say? Based on our previous studies. God investigates first. Amen. We, we show that publicly. No one's going to heaven, no one's going to... God has to investigate you and you have to pass the investigative judgments in order to go to heaven. So I want, based, now, based on that reasoning now, and that judgment starts at a specific time. Let's read Hebrews 9. And let's see, does it bring to view, issue the, bring to view the issue of the state of the dead? Hebrews 9, verse 27. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto men wants to die, but after this, the what? 
The judgment. Judgment. So after a person dies, do they go straight to heaven or straight to hell? Or does the Bible say the next step is not heaven or hell? The next step is what based on that? What, what does judgment. It say? Judgment. 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 Now think of this. If people die and then the judgments. So before, remember, before you go to heaven or hell, you must be judged. But yet it says a person dies once they die, then judgment, and only after judgment, obviously, can they go to heaven or hell. Now, let's reason. Let's reason. If people, if judgment only began, which we proved in 1844, could anyone prior to judgment, if ju I'm saying if judgment only began in 1844, and it says, it is appointed unto men to die once, and then the judgment. If people were only judged in 1844, that's when judgment began. Then question, could anyone prior of them being judged go to heaven or hell? No. Can't. Why? You have to first be judged. And only after judgment can you go to heaven or can you go to hell. So based on what I'm seeing, Hebrews 9 shows me. Brother Kevin, you have a question? Three exceptions. Yes, there are exceptions. Yes, there's exceptions. There are exceptions. Definitely there are exceptions. Yes, there are exceptions. But on a general scale, on a general scale, that this is each, you must first be judged. And then heaven or hell. So then my question then is, what have been the condition of the people prior to judgment? What has been their condition? And where are they? What has been their condition? And where are they? Because it says, in order for you to go to heaven or hell, you must first be judged. It's appointed unto men to die once, and then the judgments. Some people will thus reason. They will tell you this, that the person of the dead, they might tell you, it depends what religion they're from. If they're from Catholicism, they might tell you, maybe they tell you purgat purgatory, they, they're somewhere there waiting to go to heaven or hell. If there's some other religion, they say, no, no, no. Uh, if it's a, a Hindu religion or something like that, they'll tell you that the person has just transitioned into a cow, they'll transition into something else, and life keeps perpetuating. And so we want to see what does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach on this issue? First and foremost, let's first deal with this question. Is a man naturally immortal? That's the first thing. And then we want to go and look at the state of creation when God created man. Let's see his man naturally immortal. Come with me in your Bible to Romans. Romans chapter, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans, the second chapter. Romans 2. I want us to see Romans chapter 2, verse 7. Now, if I would say to you, I want you to seek... I want, I want you to seek for, or you tell me, you tell me I, I'm seeking for such and such. Question, do you have that thing or you, are you, or, or are you seeking to obtain that thing? If you tell me that I'm looking for such and such, I'm seeking for such and such, whatever it is, do you have it or are you seeking to obtain it? What would you, if someone says they are seeking for something? Yes, sister. Yes, we are seeking to obtain it. Oh, you are seeking to you obtain, don't you don't have it. Now, I want you to see what Paul says under inspiration of God concerning this issue of immortality. Romans chapter 2. And by the way, this was one of the verses that Ellen White's mother actually read and she actually started distancing herself from the false doctrines of the Methodist church. And the minister came to visit, visit the family. This is one of the texts that our mother saw. Let's see what text which actually opened up to our mother the issue of the state of the dead and that hell is not an eternal burning place. Let's see what it says here. Romans chapter 2 verse 7. It says, To whom by patience, continuance in well-doing, keyword, seek. Seek means I don't have it, I must, get, I must look for it, I must obtain it. I don't have it. Seek for glory, honor, immortality and eternal life. 
So if the Bible says you must seek for immortality, you must seek for eternal life, question, does man naturally inherit the sin? Nope. Man is not immortal. Man is not immortal. Satan's first lie based on the Bible is not true. It is a lie. Let me show you the Bible says was the only one who has immortality. Come with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Can someone read 1 Timothy 4 chapter 6? Verse 15 and 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 and verse 16. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who, hath all, who only mm. has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Amen. So verse 15 introduces God to us. And then in the next verse, interesting, it says, who only had immortality. The only being that has immortality based on the Bible is God. He is the only one. That's an attribute of God. Immortality is the attribute of deity. But you know what's sweet? That God wants to share this attribute with those who overcome. Like, God wants to share an attribute which only belongs to Him. He wants to share with those who overcome in this planet. You say, what do I mean? Do you, friends, you understand that those who overcome, we're going to show the verse now, they will receive immortality. Not now, but when they overcome they will receive immortality. We're going to show the time. When, what time do people receive immortality? The Bible tells us what time. But do you know what's beautiful? Imagine having a life that measures with the life of God. When I say a life that measures with the life of God, meaning as God will live forever and as God is immortal, God wants to give us that. He wants to share with us this attribute of immortality. Let's see when does he share or with whom does he share this with. And no one has it now. Come with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's see. Will immortality be shared? Will God share it? And when does he share it? 1 Corinthians 15. I want us to see 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 51. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, when he says we shall not all sleep, it's, it's referring to death. We're not all going to die. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. When does this take place? At the last trump. So when the trump is blown, what we're about to read is going to take place. For the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So now I know it's at the resurrection of the dead. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So friends, question. Does the Bible teach that people will have immortality someday? Yes. yes. But question, do people have immortality now? No. no. No one has immortality. Now question, can someone tell me based on this, when do people receive immortality? Based on this, when do people? At the second coming of Jesus. Someone says, at the second coming of Jesus. How do we know that? It says, because the dead in Christ shall rise. And it says, at the last trump. So based on the dead in Christ rising and at the last trump, let's compare that now to see, is this the second coming? The last trump and the dead in Christ rising. Is this the second coming? Come we now to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. I want us to see verse 16 and verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's see. When do the dead in Christ rise and when is the trumpet blown? I suggest at the second coming. 
Take note 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. It says, for the Lord himself, that's Jesus, shall descend from heaven, that's his second coming, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. That's what we saw in, in Corinthians. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's what we saw in Corinthians. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. What event is this? That the dead are raised and the last trumpet is blown. It's at the second coming of Jesus. So as long as Jesus has not yet come, the second coming, the visible second coming which we studied about, no one has immortality. No one has immortality. Everyone, mortal. So that, that, that lie of Satan we've just proven based on the Bible, it is true, a thorough lie. No one has immortality. Hence, we cannot, we, we cannot and should not believe in the communication of the dead. Believe that we can communicate with the dead. Someone says, but what, what, what if it's the apostles? What, what, what if it's the apostle Paul? What if Paul appears? What if Peter appears? What if John the Beloved appears? Uh, then definitely we believe them. They're, 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 friends... Oh, friends, let me show you a quotation that shows that beloved John, that the apostle Paul, that Peter, why you name the apostle. I tell you, based on inspiration, that they're going to appear very shortly. I'm saying very shortly. I'm not saying thousands, hundreds of years. I'm saying very shortly, within the next few, few, few years. You're going to see the apostle Paul. You're going to see Peter. You might see John. I don't know which ones of them, but they're going to appear. And when they appear, they're going to tell you that what's inside this book, don't, you, you must, I'm saying, if you're on the right side of believing everything this book says, they're going to come and tell you, no, 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 you misunderstood my writings. Paul's going to say, no, you clearly misunderstood what I said about the Sabbath. You misunderstood my issue on the state of the dead. What I wrote absent from the body, presence with the Lord. What I wrote, that, it, 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 all the scriptures. Now, I, if, if we have another study to do it, we will deal with all these scriptures, which Paul, not the real Paul, but when Paul appears, when Paul appears, he's going to come with these scriptures, Philippians, he's going to come with Philippians chapter 1. That is, he's pressed out of the two. He, 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 he pressed out of the two, whether he should die, whether he should stay with the church, or whether he should go and be with the Lord. Paul's going to come and quote that scripture. He's going to come with 2 Corinthians 5, or 2 Corinthians 4, somewhere there, where he says, ah, absent from the body, present with the Lord. All these scriptures are going to come. But if our feet, now someone says, I need to clearly understand these scriptures, right? If God permits, we'll study those scriptures in the next study. But let me say this, don't let two scriptures, if every, let me ask you this, if you got and you you build in something and you got a straight line, maybe you got a whole lot of sticks and you put in sticks, 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 and then you 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 almost put about a hundred sticks, and then you come, you wanna just make sure before you start before you start doing further work, and you come and you stand, you come to the beginning of the sticks and you look down, and as you look down, you see ninety eight sticks straight, and you see two sticks out. What do you do? I'm saying in the, in the natural, what do you do? Do you take the 98 and bring them in harmony with the two? Or do you take the two sticks that are out? You take the two that are out and you bring them in harmony with the 98. So if the weight of evidence of the Bible says exactly what happens, what's the true state of the dead? I'm saying the weight of evidence, meaning the weight of majority of the Bible says one thing. And maybe there's two scriptures you can't fully understand. What do you do? Do you throw away the whole bunch of the weight of evidence and run with the two? Or you try and study the two and bring them in harmony with the weight of evidence? My understanding is you study the two to bring them in harmony with the weight of evidence. You don't throw away the weight of evidence and say, I'm running with the two. Why then? That, that is foolish. Okay, Sister Jenna, so you had your hand up. Um, yes, I was just going to ask if when these spiritual beings or whatnot will become manifested, um, like you said, we'll be seeing apostles or things like that. Um, would they be ghostly or will they be like being used by actual humans? Okay. Um, 
in that sort of sense, right? Like, I'm, am I going to see a ghost or? You're not, you're not gonna. You're gonna see. You're gonna. Let, it's not gonna be a, a, a human being. It's not. I'm not. I'm saying when I say it's not. It's not. Satan's not gonna walk through human beings. It's, it's gonna be demons. Demons right. that are gonna appear. Yeah. Demons are gonna appear. Let, let's read the quotation. Let, let's see. Demon, okay. Demons are gonna literally appear, but not as a demon. They're gonna appear as whoever they wanna appear as. Actually, that's Corinthians says that, the, 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 that Satan has power to transform himself. Corinthians, um, Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. Let's see. Let's see if it's this one. This is from early writings, page 90. Now, in this quotation, the prophet identifies by name. Oh, I took him out. I took the name out. But he identifies by name an individual who is going to appear. Satan's going to literally make him appear. Does anybody know that name? She mentions him. It's the same. I just, we have got dot, dot, dot. We have got here dot, dot, dot. I, I took it out. He's actually, I believe, he's an American author. That man, she was actually, she says that Satan himself possessed that man. And the books that he... Amen. It is Thomas Paine. I, I tell you, don't even touch that man's books. Don't even... That man, inspiration says, was literally possessed by Satan himself. And he made war against the Bible. The man loved. Actually, she says Satan never had a more successful agent that he used as Thomas Paine. Very, very demonic man, evil man. It says here in early writings, page, early writings, page ninety. It says he was the father of lies. That's Satan. Blinds and deceives the world by sending forth. By sending forth. His angels to speak for the apostles. So who, who is going to appear as the apostles based on this? It's the angels, not heavenly angels, the demons. And to make it appear. Now, friends, all you need to do is, listen, if, if they come speaking, hear their words. Look what they're going to do. And make it appear that they contradict what they wrote by the dictation of the Holy Ghost when on earth. Soon as that man comes, that demon, whoever comes and he says, I'm the apostle Paul. And I'm, what you think I said, I never say. And he's trying to come and twist scripture. I know that that's a demon. Whether it's a de little demon or whether it's a man saying he's the apostle Paul. I know there's a, he's demon possessed or there's a little demon. Do you know that very soon we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna encounter demons? I'm I'm not today we do encounter demons by temptations, but very soon we're gonna encounter them face to face. Because one inspiration says every one of us have dead relatives. Besides them appearing as the as the apostles, they're gonna appear as dead relatives. She continues, she says, these lying angels make the apostles corrupt their own teachings and to declare them to be adulterated. By so doing, Satan delights to throw professed Christians and all the world into uncertainty about the word of God. Satan assigns to each of his angels a part to act. He enjoins upon them all to be sly, artful, cunning. He instructs some of them to act the part of the apostles and to speak for them whilst others are to act the part of infidels and wicked men who died cursing God, but now appear to be very religious. There is no difference made between the most holy apostles and the vilest infidels. So why does Satan make wicked men appear? Why does he make infidels appear? I know why he makes the apostles appear, the demons come as the apostles, but why would he make an infidel appear? Based on that quotation, wicked men appear. That, to show that there's no distinction between the harm and the unholy. They've been transformed or they got a truth and this is the truth you should believe. Mm. Yeah, which is not the truth, but yes. it's false. Amen. Now, think of it. If Thomas Paine is in heaven, I'm just saying because she says they're going to appear that, oh, they're very religious, that they occupy a high position in heaven. 
if the world looks and they see Thomas Paine appearing, and Thomas Paine says, you know what, I'm enjoying the bliss of heaven. I, I occupy a high position in heaven. Can you know what the world says? Why, if Thomas Paine warred against God, against the Bible is in heaven, then I can live as I wish. Heaven is my own. So it almost lulls the world into a carnal security. Live as you wish, heaven's your home. And for those Christians who are trying to cling to the Bible, then Satan says, I've got, got a delusion for you all. I'm going to make the apostles appear and contradict all what they said. And you know what's the crowning act in the great drama of deception when so-called Satan appears as Jesus to back up what the apostles have said which are not the apostles, which are demons. Are you seeing why the world will be enraged with, with this little group, the Seventh-day Adventists? Because yes, the apostles speaking to us. Yes, Jesus himself coming and he's speaking. And by the way, what Maranatha says, even they're going to appear as angels from heaven to come and affirm what the apostles are saying, which is not the apostles. So yeah, the world is looking as Jesus. There's angels from heaven. Yeah, the apostles. And yes, there's... This little group who are rebellious against God. You know what they need? The world's going to say, they need to die. They are rebellious. That's why the world's going to hate this little group, the seven Adventist remnants. Brother, I see you have your hand. Yes, sir. I think uh, this statement, in this statement, Satan is also teaching that there is repentance in the grave, mm. which is clearly a false, a yes. false doctrine. Yes, yes, yes. It's a false doctrine. Amen, amen. So, Let's look at this quickly. Come with me. Let, let's look very quickly. We will do this quickly. Let's look at the true issue when a man dies, when a man, woman dies, when someone dies. Come into Genesis chapter 2 quickly. And then we conclude. Genesis 2, verse 7. Genesis 2, verse 7. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Can someone read this for us? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Amen. So, it's interesting what the, the Bible is saying. Man doesn't possess a soul, but man became a living soul. So uh, uh, what makes up a living soul? Two things make up a living soul. It says that God formed man from the dust of the ground. One, dust of the ground. And in God, breathed into his nostrils. Number two, the breath of life. So the dust plus the breath combined. Bible says equals a living soul. Man doesn't possess a living soul that's not bible man is a living soul this is what the bible is teaching me a living soul now the christian world will tell you something else but that, that's not bible bible says man became a living soul so you are a living soul so if if somebody say how many souls are here we can count how many persons and that's how many souls are here living souls so two things make up a person dust plus breath equals a living person. Now let's see what happens in death. This is how God created us. He used two things to actually make a living person. Let's see what happens in death. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7. Actually, it's the reverse of this. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Can someone read for us Ecclesiastes chapter 12? We want to read verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto the God who gave it. Okay, so the Bible says that the dust, when a person dies, returns back to the earth. Number one. Number two is, the spirit, now someone's going to get confused. Oh, the spirit, we're going to explain this. It's the Hebrew word ruach. All that means, basically, is the breath of life. So it says that the body goes back to the dust, and the, the ruach, the, the, the breath of life, the spirit, goes back to God who gave it. 
what then is the condition of man if the body goes back to dust and as the breath of life goes back to god we're going to prove that's the breath of life the spirit is the breath we'll give a verse for that goes back to god what then is the state of man i'm going to we'll, we'll give bible text now but the state of man when the when the dust the body goes back to dust and the, the spirit the breath goes back to god that state of man when he's dead as a god calls it jesus calls it the bible calls it asleep it's as if man is un. why jesus calls it asleep is because man is unconscious the person is the person who's dead is unconscious and jesus calls it asleep asleep means you don't, you're not aware of anything that is happening above you anything that is happening around you that is asleep so jesus when he was trying to illustrate what can i use to illustrate death he said oh asleep because why you're not aware of anything now, you know what also you're not aware of is time. I don't know if this happens to you or when you wake up, you know exactly what time it is. But when a person sleeps and they wake up, do you know sometimes you can think it's time to wake up, but what corrects you is when you look at the time. So you, when a person is asleep, they're unconscious of how much time has gone from the time they went to sleep till the time they wake up. Actually, they, it's almost like a... Especially when you know you never sleep properly, it's like you just put your. Have you ever put your head down and then boom, the alarm? It's like yo, I just put my head down. Meantime, four, three, five, six hours went, but to you it was like I just put my head down, and that's how it is from the time a person dies to the time they're resurrected, as if they just put their head down, and then boom, resurrection morning. So now I want us to see this issue of this the spirit because someone says, whoa, 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 says a spirit. No, no, don't be con- the spirit just means breath of life. Let's prove that. Come with me to Job twenty-seven. Job chapter 27. Job 27. Let's see. Job is going to do something which is called Hebrew parallelism, where he says one thing and then he repeats it. Same thing, but he says it in a different way. Job chapter 27. Job 27. We want to see verse 3. Job 27 verse 3. This is Hebrew parallelism. Now tell me, what does Job do here? He's going to say it in the same verse. He's going to say the same thing twice, but in a different way. Job 27 verse 3. All the wild, the bread is in me. You're saying it one way. All the wild, the bread is in me. He's going to say it in a different way. The spirit of God is in my nostrils. Based on Job, what does he liken to the bread? Based on this. What, what does he, he says all the while the breath is in me and he continues he says the spirit of God is in my nostrils what is Job likening the breath of life to in this verse what is it synonymous the spirit the spirit so when the bible says spirit we don't have to be confused all it means is the breath of life that is the life force so we see what happens in, 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 in creation breath Dust plus bread equals a living soul. Man doesn't have some soul inside of him. He is a living soul. When man dies, the, bre- the, the, the body goes back to dust. The, the, the bread of life goes back to God. No matter who you are, whether you're righteous, whether you're wicked, whoever you are, it goes back to God. Sister Jen? I've heard some people uh, argue that the spirit of God that is in breath or that he gave man is the Holy Spirit and that um, that that leaves us when we pass away or that that is um, the Spirit of God meaning that is the Spirit he gave us for us to be like conscious and that our consciousness goes back to him meaning that we will be sitting there in heaven there's those two arguments I've heard. No, the, the breath is the vital force of man, the life force of man. Actually, you'll see this in inspiration. That when inspiration refers to the creation of man, she speaks of the vital force God, God placed in man. That, that, is, that is the breath of life, that vital force. You'll see this throughout her writing. She keeps referring to the vital force, the vital force, the vital force. It's the, it's the force of life. That is the, 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 the life current, so to speak. If that is taken away from us, James says, a man dies. That's James 2. He says the body without the spirit, the life force is dead. 
and then he says faith without works is dead S same thing he's using as a as a to compare so what are we saying that the spirit is not referring to the spirit of god because that leads to pantheism if we're gonna if we're gonna say that it opens up the door to pantheism. It opens up the door to the, uh, the, the alpha of apostasy. Now, that's not going to be my study now. But Dr. Kellogg was teaching that God dwells in the sinner. And if the spirit of God is God. So if we're going to say that the, spirit, the, the life was, there are people who are living in open rebellion against God. And we say, oh, that person is alive. That means the spirit of God is in him. Then we, that, that, is, that is alpha of apostasy. That is what Dr. Kellogg was teaching. So those who are teaching that, they're, they, 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 they're going down a wrong path. Yeah, they, that is a wrong path to, to go down. So, so I want us now to look and see that mm, there's so much on the issue of the state of the dead, but I know most of us studied it, so I'm not going to spend, give a lot of, lot of text. But what I'm going to show is this, that when man is dead, what we call death, the Bible calls it a sleep, meaning the person is unconscious of anything that is happening and they have nothing to do with anything that is done under the sun. That means they're not coming back to communicate to me no secret message. God is not resurrecting no one. Actually, you see this in the parable when um, the, the, the person said, um, please um, send someone from the dead to go back and speak to my brothers so that they might, so that they might be converted. And what the answer came back, if they will not believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one be risen from the dead. So what God is saying that if, if someone cannot believe the Bible, he said he's not performing no supernatural, sending secret message to us from, from, from people who have died, bringing them back to life so they can give us some secret message so we don't end up lost. No, no. God says if they will not believe this book, God says nothing will persuade them. Nothing will persuade them. <coughs> Now, what I want us to do, let's see what does the Bible say concerning this issue of man. Come with me to John chapter 11. And then I want to show you, and then maybe we'll conclude on that point, that the way you die is the way you come up. That's what the Bible teaches me. The way you die is the way you come up. So I believe that if a man dies drunk, he's going to be resurrected drunk. If a man died on some drugs, he overdosed himself on some drugs, he's going to come up drugged up. If a man died in war, he's going to come up when he's resurrected. He's going to come up almost in that state of, 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 of fury, so to speak, in, in, that, in that state of battle. If a man died hungry, he's going to resurrect hungry. Now, let me say this. When, I, when I'm saying all this, I'm saying, saying this to those who come up in the second resurrection. If you come up in the first resurrection, um, you're going to come up immortal. You're going to come up with no effects of this mortal body, whatever, not going to affect you. But to those who have died lost, they're going to come up the exact way they went down. Exact way. They went down by death, they come up. You know what? Maybe before, before let's go. Come with me to Luke 8. I don't know where I told you to go, but come with me to Luke 8. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Oh, John 11. Okay, we're going to go to John 11. Let's read Luke okay. chapter 8. Now, Jesus was going to heal this, this young girl. And while he was going to heal the young girl, a message came to Jesus. And the message came to actually the man who wanted um, the servant. Who, the, the servant came to the message to the father to say, worry, don't worry the master anymore. The, the, the damsel is dead. And then I want you to see what happens. Actually, let's read verse 49. It says, Why did he yet spake? There cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Question, what, what is the condition of the damsel, the young girl? She is dead. Let's keep reading. Now, it's interesting what Jesus says when he, he's going to tell us what, what condition she is in. Yes, dead, but he's going to help us. Verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, he answered, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall, be, she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. Verse 52, And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not, she is not dead. But look what Jesus calls it. But sleepeth. So Jesus was calling dead 
in their eyes, oh, she's dead, she's gone forever. Jesus says, no. Everyone what we call dead today, Jesus calls sleep. Everyone what we call dead. Why you say, but now let me ask you this. If someone's sleeping, what does that indicate? Or they eat, let me, let me say this in the natural. If somebody is sleeping, okay now, so you get it. Okay, let's. They're if, unconscious. They're unconscious, yes. There's also something I want to bring out. If I say the person is sleeping, what does that indicate? Are they, are they going to stay in that position? Or, or is the time coming? They will awake. They're going to awake. So when Jesus refers to people who go under the first death, he always refers to it as a sleep. Why? Because everyone's going to awake, whether righteous, whether wicked. He knows you're going to have to awake. Sister Emma? Sister Emma, you can speak. Yes, they're, they're resting. You can also say that the person is resting. Yes, that's true. They are resting. They are resting. That is true. Let's, let's keep reading. Verse 53. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all out and took her by the hand. Now, you know what? Before, before I continue, I just need to, ask, I need to ask this question. When someone is sick and they are dying, they are sick and they, they, they are almost on, the, they are on their final, 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 final before they die. Question, is that person who is sick and dying, are they, are they hungry, are they eating a lot, are they eating food? Or they, well, no, no, I'm saying think. If, some, if you know, you, some, some of us get sick and we can't even eat. Now imagine someone dying. <laughs> what would they be eating? No, they're not getting, especially if, if their sickness is quite lengthy. They haven't eaten for a long time. So just keep that in mind. This girl was sick sometime. Jesus has called. He's coming to heal her. Number one. Number two is this I want us to see. That when somebody is resurrected, we're going to see in this passage. When someone is resurrected, when Jesus resurrects them, he gives them back their same spirit, the same breath of life that departed at the point of death. There's not nothing new. When they resurrected, it's the exact same breath of life. So God's not giving my breath of life to someone else when, when everyone's resurrected or somebody else's breath of life to me because everybody's breath of life was stamped, so to speak, with our characters, so to speak. So when we are resurrected, we are resurrected with the same characters we died with. Now let's see. Let's see now. What does this verse show us? It says, verse 54, And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Made arise. Take note when she, what happens in verse 55. And her, not any spirit, and her spirit. Give me another name for spirit. Breath of life. Her breath of life came again, and she arose straight away. Take note what Jesus does. Take note what Jesus does. And he commanded to give her meat. That means give her food. Why would Jesus, why would Jesus say give her food? Because she hasn't eaten for a while. She's hungry. Amen. Amen. So can you see that the way she died, she died hungry. Can you see when she was resurrected, she, she, re, she resurrected hungry. And the first command of Jesus is give her something to eat. So you can see the state you die in as the state you come up in. Sister Jen, I see you have your hand. Isn't that what happened with Jesus when he resurrected? He went up to the upper room and it was like, you know, I'm hungry, give me something to eat. And they gave him the fish and the honeycomb. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, I'm not going to say so much with Jesus because um, remember when Jesus resurrected, he, he took back, he, 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 remember when he came, he, he, he became like fully man, so to speak. But when he resurrected, he took back, he, he, he laid aside his divinity, so to speak, for some time. But when he resurrected, he took it back. So, yeah, divinity, divinity is beyond um, humanity. Oh, okay. Yes, gotcha. yes. So now, what, let, let's come to our conclusion now. And then maybe we, I want us just to see in, in John this issue of death, the state of man. Come with me to John. Chapter um, 11, John chapter 11. John chapter 11, can someone read for us John chapter 11, verse 11. Can someone read John 11, verse 11. Tell me what Jesus says here concerning Lazarus. Le by the way, Lazarus is dead, he's going to tell us that. But can someone read for us John 11, 11. These things 
said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may wake him out of sleep. Mm. You want to continue, sister? Then said his disciple, Lord, if he sleep, he should do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Can you see, but this is crystal clear. There's many, many texts we can show and show and show. Even First Thessalonians says, that those who sleep shall arise out of their graves. So the Bible consistently shows that death is asleep. This is throughout the Bible. Death is asleep, meaning one is unconscious. Now I'm not going to read many, many texts. We can conclude now. But in Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6, says that the living know they shall die, but the dead know not anything. And it says, when someone dies, because someone says, oh, you don't give this person this, they're going to want you. They're going to they're gonna have revenge against you and they're dead and they come, come for you. But you know what the verse says? Their love, their hatred, their envy has all now perished. That means no love, no hatred, no envy. Nothing they have. So Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 and 6 show that when a person dies, all emotions, everything, they, they have nothing more to do with anything under the sun. Absolutely nothing. All knowledge gone. They don't know anything. So, yeah, the Bible is showing us, friends, man is not immortal. Man, when he dies, he is asleep. His spirit goes back to God. The breath of life goes back to God. He waits to come out of the grave at the resurrection. When is the resurrection? When Jesus Christ comes back the second time. That's when the resurrection takes place. That's when those who are righteous, this, this, this mortal will put on immortality. That's what the Bible says at the second coming of Jesus. Now, you could also see in the book of Acts that the righteous don't go to heaven at the point of death. The book of Acts teaches, maybe let's just read the book of Acts quickly. Come with to Acts. So if the apostle Paul comes and talks, you can say, no, 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 you, you are not the apostle Paul because the righteous are all waiting the resurrection. The Bible speaks of David as a man of the God's own heart. And I want you to see what it says about David in Acts 2 verse 29. Acts 2, 29. It says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb, his grave is with us unto this day. So David is dead, he's buried, his grave is with them unto his day when Peter was preaching. Now let's read verse 34. Tell me, is David in heaven, this righteous man who wrote the book of Psalms, is, look what it says. It says, For David has not ascended into the heavens. So David himself has to wait, like everyone else, for the resurrection. David is not in heaven. Yeah, so the Bible is crystal clear, friends. That man is not naturally immortal. The issue of the state of the dead, when man dies, he is in a deep sleep. Bible teaches he will resurrect, yes, with the righteous, or with the wicked, he will resurrect. But not at the moment of death is he resurrected. He must wait until Jesus Christ comes back the second time. This is what the Bible teaches. Now, there are two resurrections. We'll study it in our ne next week. There are two resurrections. And what separates these two resurrections is 1,000 years. From the first resurrection to the second is 1,000 years. We, we, we'll look at that. There's two resurrections. Resurrection of the righteous and resurrection of the wicked. So we're going to stop here and we're going to pray. I think this was very simple and it was not new to us. So we're going to pray. Yeah, let us pray. Let's pray. Loving Father, we just want to thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much for truth. Thank you so much for loving us and for revealing these things to us. Father, this is one truth that perplexes so many people, the issue of the state of the dead. And thank you for making it so clear to us. Father, we are so thankful for this truth, which is not just brings comfort to our heart concerning what really happens to loved ones who die, friends, 
but it also reveals to us or shields us, so to speak, from the delusions that Satan's going to take the world captive by. Father, this is so, so essential. Please, Lord, we just pray. There are so many thousands in this, thousands in this world who are ignorant concerning this truth. And because of ignorance of this truth, they will open up themselves to spiritualism. Please, may you help us, Lord, that as opportunity presents itself, wherever we are, to work, whether we engage with other people, that we will try and draw their minds to this truth. Help them to comprehend the issue of the state of the dead. And this is something which everyone who is living on this planet is interested in, for everyone has dead loved ones. So please, Lord, help us to be wise, and may this truth, this truth can be an opening door in which we can point people to Jesus. Please, Father, we also pray and ask that you protect us for what is to come upon this world. We read in early writings that the whole, almost the entire world will be on board, deceived by spiritualism. Help us, Lord, to be amongst that little company who are going to travel that narrow path. Even though trials and conflicts come, may our affection, may our love be centered upon Jesus, and may we joyfully bear whatever cross heaven requires us to bear. Lord, thank you for your providence within our lives. Thank you so much for what you have done. Thank you so much for even these studies, these truths we are learning. We love you, Father, and we commit all these things humbly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Someday the silver cord will break And I no more as now shall sing but all oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king. And I shall see him face to 